So what makes you think you can locate my 4x4? My box has VD, trust me. Your what? VD, vibrational detection. Then it must be able to pick up this guy as well. No, members of our force were taught to avoid VD. I got a question over there. Hi there, my name is Jamie Johnson from The Telegraph in London. Uh, it's a question for Richard Madden. Um, I'm not sure if you're a betting man at all, but your odds have shortened to two to one to take over from Daniel Craig as the next James Bond. <laughs> now, I only bring this up because you wore the signature white tuxedo and pulled it off very well, may I say, last night. It's a done deal, isn't it? <laughs> This Organized Chaos podcast is brought to you by Gems Art Studio. Gems Art Studio is an online store that allows access to prints that you can use for most anything, obviously as just a picture, or as a wallpaper, or as a bookmark, or anything you can think of. You can find Gems Art Studio at etsy.com slash shop slash Gems Art Studio. This podcast is also brought to you by listeners like you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to another Organized Chaos podcast. My name is Bobby Quarters. With me, as always, is Bob. Bob, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, Bobby? Oh, not so bad. Not so bad. Uh, had a pretty <laughs> interesting Halloween weekend, but I'm loving this beautiful fall weather we're having. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's easy. It's, this is a Halloween. I don't have the kids, so it's easy for me to forget that Halloween was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people are yeah. showing me their costumes like, oh yeah, that was a thing, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I dig <laughs> Halloween. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, we we did. I did get a chance to watch some scary stuff, and actually, I uh, I had ordered some books earlier in the month, and I'm very happy that the last one arrived because I ordered a two books of a series, Ooh. like you know the first one and the follow up. Mm -hmm. The follow up arrived first, so I was like debating like I could just start reading it, you know. And only wait for the first one to show up, and I'm just happy to say that the first one showed up on a Saturday night. So uh, I came home from work on Sunday and uh, I uh, cracked open the book, the first one, and got into it. So I'm very happy to dig into this new book. Nice, nice. Ah, uh, so like I was looking into the news, and yeah, you know, you want to know what I came across? And what's that? Did you know that Dune cul culturally, culturally appropriated uh, Islamic culture? Because uh, I didn't know that. According to NBC News, it did. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize those aliens were Islamic. I didn't, I didn't realize, realize that they either. had a concept of what Islam is. Yeah, I didn't realize 8,000 okay. years in the future. Okay, NBC <laughs> News. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I read a little bit as much into the article as I could, but I, I cringed throughout the whole wow. thing. Just like, wow. It's okay, so like the biggest descriptor of these guys is that they have blue eyes. Cool. Oh, did I lose you? Did we just get zucked? That starting went well. <laughs> <laughs> did that? Did we just get zucked? Yeah, I think NBC <laughs> News is watching us, and they disconnected us. <laughs> you better not be talking it about have... it. You. <laughs> Jeez, we haven't even said anything yeah. yet. We just laughed at your stupidity. No, no, I'm reading. The, I, I, I read as much of the article as I could, but it's, it's we're dealing with a culture 8,000 years in the future, and I'm one of those guys. Yeah. I like to be as sensitive as possible about other cultures and all that jazz. But guys, this article is a bit much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> 8,000 years in the future, we're talking about an alien, not, I guess, technically not an alien race, since they're all humans, but it's so far removed. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's nuts. Like, yeah, how? 
How? How? <laughs> yeah. I, I think, like, I'm just kind of getting sick of the whole argument of cultural appropriation. Yeah, there are times where maybe you shouldn't do it, but for the most part, like, things have been exchanged so much. America is the melting pot, as you've uh, brought up earlier. It's... Yeah. This is what we are. <laughs> yeah, America is the melting pot, and... Uh... Like, well, like we were talking before we started today, like how many, like, what is it, like over 85%, I'm guessing, of the population of our country came through the same port in the same city, mm -hmm. thus giving it the name. I mean, it, it's, yeah, America is, is really a melting pot. So, yeah. Now, it, it, remind me, I'm not too sure. The original author of Doom, what, what was he an American or Oh, that's not? a good question. Uh, let me look that up. Uh, Google is here. <laughs> Google for the win. Right. It just says American. Yeah. Okay, so Tacoma, I imagine Washington. Just... So yeah, he's pretty American. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> All right, so I imagine that uh, he just said a race of aliens that happen to look like humans. Well, not even a race of aliens. No, they're they are supposed to be humans, but they they live they out are, in the desert. Yeah. Who knows That's who's right, going to yeah. live out on an alien desert eight thousand yeah. years from now? <laughs> Who knows? And I mean, Who, yeah. If we want to give them some credit, <laughs> which I absolutely would, like the second lead in this story is Lady Jessica. I mean, look for a character in Tolkien's yeah. original works. That's female. Okay. That's nearly as prominent as her. Yeah, yeah I couldn't think of one. Yeah, it's, that, that's one of the issues I have with Tolkien. I I think he's great, but yeah, uh, there's like no women in those stories. They're there, but Jesus, <laughs> they, they, he doesn't have much for them to do. No. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to bring that up because I think cultural appropriation has gone a little insane. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and, and I agree. I mean. I think it's insane when there's something like a Hollywood will make a movie and mm -hmm. it's clearly been whitewashed, you know, like mm -hmm. like Tom Cruise, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it is a point to where, like, I can understand that doing that will sell the story a little bit better and, you know, m make it appeal to a wider audience, which is pretty much every movie studio's goal. Mm hmm to at least get a return. Yeah, but. oh yeah. And you can definitely have some fun with it, because I remember on uh, Chappelle's show, I don't remember who the guy's name was, but he had this great piece, and he's like, I, uh, you know, Last Mohican starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Last Samurai starring Tom Cruise. You know, I wrote a movie called The Last N-Word on the Face of the Planet. It's gonna star Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> That was Paul Mooney. Yes, that. that's that's him. That What's really awesome. funny is like, well, speaking of Dave Chappelle, you know, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I feel that I, I feel that the uh, cancel culture is way out of hand. You see, yeah, I don't know if it's a, account of, so much of a thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just think it's just kind of, yeah, I don't know what it means anymore. Yeah, no, it's it's gone overused to death. Uh, I, I mean, I remember. Me nuts. <laughs> yeah, I remember when it was used for things like good. Like you know, they they showed the guy from a uh, Jimmy John's like with a rare animal that he had personally hunted down and killed. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. So I'm never eating at Jimmy John's again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like people like Harvey Weinstein. Something as simple Bill as that. Cosby. Yeah. It's like they they need it. <laughs> they do. Yes. But yes. Uh, I think we got a bit ahead of ourselves. We didn't even yeah. like it. You're you're. If you're listening or watching this, you don't even know what this episode's about. This episode is about whatever yeah, we feel like. We're going to do whatever we want. No. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to talk aimlessly yeah. and just try to fill in that about two hours yeah. usually of just us breathing out hot air. Yeah. That's it's, pretty it's much all It's going to be a planned. lot of hot air. I hope you appreciate it on this cold, cold day. <laughs> A lot, yeah, a lot of pauses and random Google searches and a lot of, um, yeah. Hey, I pride <laughs> myself on the, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I plan on just oh, no, we got... blanking for at least 15 minutes today, so you have that to look forward to. Oh, I mean, I'm sure, 
yeah, I'm sure you and I will probably do that too. And there'll be a lot of us like, all right, um, because we got a, uh, we decided to do something fun this week. Yes, uh, we uh, did throw a movie in for appreciated. So we would at least have something else to do, but something to do this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was watch a really bad science fiction movie starring Jesse Ventura. Oh, the the, the master thespian himself, Jesse Ventura. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The uh the true Ayatollah. <laughs> God. <laughs> and uh we we also uh, both uh wrote a, a small pitch for our own James Bond movie. Yes. I guess uh, we had enjoyed talking about Bond so much the last time <laughs> that we decided to go uh all in and just pitch our own movie for it. Yeah, no, I think it's I, I don't know, it just seemed like a fun idea because like James Bond is like a franchise that's like wide open now after no time to die. Like, what are they going to do yeah. with that? They could do whatever they want at this point. So, what would we do with it? Absolutely. So, we're going to give the studios yeah. some advice they're guaranteed not to follow. <laughs> and guaranteed to hear plenty of feedback on ours, our Ooh. own thoughts, oh, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, to start out the day, we do have some great trash ahead of us. Yes. Uh, we're going to dive into the trash first. Oh, yes. A brass. <laughs> <This is> a... <laughs> Guardian yeah, of the is, universe. <laughs> yes, which we still haven't determined if it's um if it's a promotion up from Galaxy or you know that because you know Braxis Guardian of the Universe, it's a 1991 science fiction movie that was directed by Damian Lee, starring Jesse Ventura and Sol Thorson, and a cameo by a Belushi. Yeah, Belushi. It's not it's the good James. one, don't it's worry. It's 1991. <laughs> don't get your hopes up. Yeah. It's James. It's 91. This is after Jim died. <laughs> or no, John died. No, I, I, that, that was part of my notes. I, I put on here, what was it? Uh, so if you're looking for a low-budget Terminator with really crappy action, you have a Braxis. And don't worry, if you're wondering, only one of these has an inexplicable cameo by Jim Belushi. <laughs> That makes no sense why Jim Belushi is in this movie. Oh, like I'm watching it and I'm like, oh, hey, it's is Jim, that Belushi? Jim Belushi? Oh my god, it's Jim Belushi and he's gone. It's literally like Yeah, I think I don't I think even he know might have just wandered two shots. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that was in that that was in that diner scene, if I'm not mistaken. No, there it was, was it was a school diner? office. He was like the principal. That's right, that's right. I think he just wandered on set that day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can you read this? Okay. Okay, cool, you're good. Hey, I'm here to work. <laughs> Jim Belushi. What? Who is this man? I, I have no idea. Yeah. I didn't know Let's we had Jim it. Belushi money for this movie. <laughs> we we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie, um, pretty much the plot of it is is uh Thorson and uh, uh Jesse Ventura here. Uh their characters' names uh, Jesse is uh, Abraxas and uh, uh Thorson is a. Uh, Sandakis, I, I, uh, I, I just thought this cicadas. cicadas. He's cicadas. Cicadas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's cicadas. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they are an intergalactic. They are both uh, former partners of an intergalactic police force that police the intergalactic universe. Yeah. It's never really explained. They're just space cops, pretty much. Uh, it appears like their uh, main base is this very small enclosed room with two guys in it. <laughs> And a lot of red light. Yes. A lot of red backlight. A <laughs> lot of red backlight. Oh my god. And random, like, uh, you remember uh, that scene in um, uh, Skyfall, where uh, Bond is in prison and we see all those computer towers? It looks like they got about a half of those, but they're from the 70s, so they were like those ones that are just metal little housing units. Yeah. All <laughs> standing in front of them, so you, you could tell it's just state-of-the-art <laughs> stuff for 91. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But yeah, uh, um, well, cicadas, yeah, cicadas goes to this weird, far off planet that goes by the unusual name of Earth. Earth. <laughs> of course, <laughs> we didn't even get a. We don't even have like a quadrant of the of the known galaxy in there. Just this weird named planet. No, uh, well, I just love the idea that he's the guardian of the universe, and instantly, you know, like ninety nine percent of this movie is probably going to be in some forest on Earth. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> didn't expect the Arctic landscape. Yeah, that was yeah, kind that, of a, that was a little it, surprising, it, but it it, it was kind of well. The movie theme opened up, and to me, it gave me like some serious Terminator vibes. Yes, 
serious Terminator vibes. But, but if we're talking music, I want to say there's at least two scenes where it's like maybe an action or a chase scene where it's like smooth jazz is being played. And I am completely... <laughs> yeah, just, that was a weird choice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just like, yeah, what? Did they, get, did they get Kenny G for this soundtrack and just went for it? I think he was just recording in the next room, so they just kind of moved a yeah. mic over. Put a, put a mic right next to it. Okay, we got a soundtrack yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, just kind of kind of opened the door and leaned it in. <laughs> Nothing? No, we recorded <laughs> ourselves. We were... Oh, we had Kenny G money? Shh. No, no. no. It's, it, it, this movie, I'm sure, like, you know, like it was a lot like that scene in Holy Grail where they go, Camelot, Camelot, it's only a model. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, Cicada is, goes to Earth, randomly comes across to a woman, and what well, it seems like the guy might be doing the "I hey, I ran out of gas, whatever," and then he chases oh, the, the car guy won't out. Start. Yeah, yeah, and then he 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 he's like a, going to impregnate her, and boy oh boy, what a what a hot and spicy love scene that was. <laughs> yeah, and you know. Yeah, it happened. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she went through nine months of pregnancy within the span of 30 seconds yeah, and no, gave birth. No, his his glowing hand on her tummy was very uh, impregnatable. <laughs> He's got the touch. Yeah, definitely. That's <laughs> definitely what that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to put a little, little video segment of that uh, together. <laughs> one thing I definitely want to stress. So we have Cicadas as the main villain. Pretty much throughout this. Uh, in case you're wondering, yes, we know it's pronounced Secundus. It's Cicadas, okay? Yes. And then uh, Abraxas as Jesse hey, Ventura. Hey. Man, <laughs> Jesse Ventura is acting circles around Secundus, uh, or Cicadas. I just, and what's weird is, God. like, Secundus, yeah. he, if you look at his IMDb, he has an impressive body of, of work in his filmography. I didn't even notice that, man. Yeah, he, he he's played a he played a featured henchman in one of the Lethal Weapons. Uh, he's pretty much plays like that big bad guy, tough dude, a lot of the time. But man, well, he but he also played the fours in Walrats. Yeah, oh, that, that, that was way I he did a way better job in that. It's not even close. I mean, well, he, he he hardly said anything yeah. in the movie too. I don't think he had any lines. But Flores didn't he have lines? No, I don't think he had yeah, any. He sold that role, you know. He did not sell this. Yeah, role. I think it was maybe that they took it away because I think I remember hearing something about Kevin Smith saying like, "Yeah, it would," but uh, he could barely speak English when we filmed yeah. this. Well, uh, so. they were both in uh, Running Man. Yeah, they both but were in Running think, Man. Uh, Cicadas only had like one line. It was something about steroids. He was going to fight Arnold, and then. Uh, Richard Dawson asked him to buy, asked by Arnold. He said something about steroids and walked away. <laughs> well, I know that a lot of the roles that Ventura had had, like I believe around and like before and after this, mm -hmm. he worked with Arnold quite a bit. Yeah, well, there was that in uh, Predator, obviously, because he doesn't have yeah. time to bleed. <laughs> well, yeah, and also um, uh, Thornson, too, worked a lot with them. So they've all worked. Like the three of them did work a lot. So I guess that. You know, Arnold has Feg beat up him quite a bit. <laughs> well, you know that was that was something interesting. I, I found out while compiling a little bit of information on it. Because yeah, this uh, this movie uh, the the plot moves rather quickly at first. It moves quickly and, and then like super fucking slow. <laughs> and then it pumps the brakes. Yeah, real hard, and it drags on up until the ending. So as opposed to a movie having that dragging mm -hmm. part kind of be leading up to where all the all the cool stuff happens, mm -hmm. no, we kind of get some like laughable, mediocre stuff in the beginning, yeah. and then just some painful filler. Yeah, the the movie has two speeds. It's a uh, just kind of laughably fun, perfectly bad movie, and then, and then boring, and then molasses, yeah. and then molasses, yeah. Ugh. and not no, good molasses. No. Like the has gone sour. So. Oh, so uh, as we stated earlier, this woman who got impregnated by um uh, cicadas, yes. uh, she uh, de delivers child rather quickly, mm -hmm. and after giving birth, which seemed like really not that be that 
No, no, traumatic. it just kind of popped out. Oh. Yeah, it's like, you know, we see her stomach expand, and then she just has a child swollen up and wrapped up. And then she just treks all the way back to a town on foot. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're, we're forgetting how Registers Braxis the... was ordered to kill them both and didn't. Oh, yeah, uh, he didn't. But, like, apparently the deal with the baby is, uh, uh, what, the baby will grow up and be able to think of the anti-life equation. So Cicadas and Darkseid have very much the same idea on how to, uh, fuck around with life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because all this heavy plot stuff is just shoehorned in right now, and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, you could have established this before we got into it. No, 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 <laughs> we just gotta get into it. <laughs> Yeah, we just got to get into it. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I I do want to stress, like uh, Braxis and uh, Cicadas, they do have that little action scene in that forest, and uh, they do. It's tough to follow. It is not great art. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's it. A lot of a lot of this whole movie, especially yeah. the action sequence, are really horribly lit. Oh well, and and especially terribly lit. Like, you have Jesse Ventura as your lead, and then this other guy who is just a Hulk as well. You want to yeah. have some good action in that movie. Because that's, yeah, you that's what you're hanging it on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's either that or the raw charisma of Jesse Ventura. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, so, she gives verse, takes the kid back. We see the process of her registering the kid and all that whole nine, and then we do a time skip ahead. Mm -hmm. Two years later, as the kid is becoming more of age, which, what, was like six, seven, I think? Yeah, I, I, I want to say they said like five, but he was at least six or seven. Maybe even ten. Yeah, or, yeah, a kid, I, I would have guessed twelve or thirteen. Yeah. That kid was like, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty big for his age. yeah. <laughs> I want to say they said five. Uh, Possibly. It wouldn't be shocking if they, they wrote the, down the rap, rough draft of the script where it's five years, and then they found out while filming that uh, they didn't want to do five years and just didn't refilm it. <laughs> and just kind of kept it like that. Yeah, uh, that's, sure, why not? Neither. <laughs> that's a big old five-year-old, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. He's talking like a five-year-old, right? Yeah, five year olds yeah. say full, complete sentences. Yeah, uh, yeah. five-year-olds are very do, verbose. <laughs> he'll do just fine. It's good enough. <laughs> yeah, so the kid, the, the Tommy... Mm -hmm. ah, I forgot his name. Uh. Yeah, oh, I remembered. <laughs> hey, I remembered Cicadas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, everything I just keep writing about is how, uh, you know, he has two kills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's about five years later. Sorry, yeah. But yeah, he does, the kid doesn't speak at all. Yes. But like he does show a lot of it, like intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, strange abilities, as they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's um, uh, Cicadus escapes from the jail that he was put in in the, be in the beginning after him and Abraxas' little battle, That's I guess. Right, yeah. I, I could tell. And he goes right His back dark to match. Yeah. If I could throw a wrestling term in there, there you go. Dark yeah. match. <laughs> dark match meaning one that's not televised. Ooh, no, Bob. Ooh, well, uh, <laughs> that that's very much that action scene. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't have been at all. I can see why this is this movie is in the public domain, and I was able to watch all of it on YouTube. Oh, is it in public domain? I, I'm, I'm assuming. I I know it's on Amazon I, Prime, and it's free yeah. with ads, and not a single ad played. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's ads in the Rift Tracks version. Probably. That's positive. probably a much better version, too. I, I will probably be checking that out. Maybe I'll check it out tonight when the kids come over. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they go back and they have another face-off. But this time, uh, Cicadus is able to get away from Abraxas. And he steals a cop car, right? Or is it a motorcycle? Or is that later? God, I don't remember. Yeah, he steals something. He steals something. Yeah, which no, get... they, they get into a couple fights. I do remember oh, wait, noting. No. He walks up to that family and steals their car. Yeah. And they also had a camper there, too, that they give Abraxas a ride into town with. 
and that's when his little uh, talkie box on his wrist. That's right. Yes. That's right. He has a they they, they have, he has this device that's like a wrist com communicator sort of sort of thing. Yeah. But it's called a box. Mm-hmm. And there's a scene where it talks while he's riding with these people. Yeah. The woman asks him, "What's that?" And she's he's like, "Oh, that's my box." You're what? Mm-hmm. I think when I first watched this, uh, that woman and I replied to ask the same question in unison. Excuse me? No, no, like, wasn't it even a line where he's like, it's my box for my VD or something like that? <laughs> it's my box for my VD, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's just, oh. Uh, we're going that direction with this movie? <laughs> Either this writer is... <laughs> an evil bastard comedic <laughs> genius <laughs> and he and uh, he, well i mean i i that writer took the money and ran uh, yeah it's like <laughs> vd existed back then right they called it vd right yeah i'm pretty <laughs> sure yes uh, it oh, did I for think. a fact because you know like i'm thinking of frank zappa's uh song catholic girls oh, okay uh here, here, catholic girls, here it is and she gave me vd so, uh, in the car. So what makes you think you can locate my 4x4? Abraxas, my box has VD. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's just, oh. oh. And, of course, VD stands for vibrational detection. Didn't you know that? Yes, vib vibrational that's detection. That's obviously yes. what VD stands for. It won't stand for anything else. <laughs> I mean, I at some point I had to ask myself, are you just being immature about this? No, it's hilarious. It is. You no, know, it, it's it's hilarious. It might be immature, but it's hilarious, dude. His box yeah, has VD. Be, <laughs> his box has VD. <laughs> yeah, you should probably. Oh. I think they make lotion for that. So. And it's even funnier is like one of his wrestling names, or his wrestling name is the body. Oh God. <laughs> Jesse the Body Ventura. <laughs> His VD <laughs> and his box with VD. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> oh man. That's the thing. This movie, yeah, it's got its drive points, but man, there are points where you are just chuckling, and you and you are not laughing with the movie. You're laughing <laughs> you're, at the movie. You're straight <laughs> laughing at it. Yeah. Oh yes, and not so, enough that my force was taught to avoid VD. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. well i guess that's good that's good life lessons for us for us <laughs> yeah and that definitely was the point in the movie where i realized nope they know damn well what they're doing and saying <laughs> yeah they know damn well what they're saying <laughs> oh but yeah but i mean a practice they, we, they both oh they both get to town oh i was gonna say like when um uh cicadist arrives at the school yeah and threatens to kill the children. That's one at right. A time. Like, uh, he takes a classroom hostage. I'd actually completely forgotten about that. I think the movie <laughs> might have too, because that happens, and then it just do they even it's follow a... up on that at all? No, I think like the next scene he invades that police station. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. No, he 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 no, he goes into the classroom, tells the teacher, Hey, uh uh, go find uh Tommy and okay, yeah. And if yeah, you don't, I'm going to start culminator. killing your students. Well, he, he calls him the culminator. Yeah, the culminator. Uh, <laughs> and then but his I don't recall any follow-up with that. <laughs> but his accent is really thick, so it sounds like he's saying the culminator. The culminator. <laughs> the culminator. Yeah, yes. it's like he wants a culminator? Yeah. Get this man a comb. Yeah, dude, I think they're like 99 cents at the store, man. You should be fine. Did he just... <laughs> You just destroyed a general store, sir. Yeah. I'm sure within that rubble you could find some. I mean, I Probably know... Probably still in package. I know stocks being unreliable, but we should be able to get you a fucking comb. I'm sure Ace can melt to some plastic. Ah, shit, man. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, but yes, uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, largely what I remember is kind of just the two of them kind of in town... Yeah, the, the, the small in town stuff. Yeah. And because the, the drag, you know, we, we say it's a drag, but in reality, though, it plays really quickly. It is just horribly paced. Yeah, no. It, it, yeah. It, like, honestly, like, there's plenty of stuff that happens in this movie. 
But there like, is. They don't pace it out well at all. So like you'll get hit with a couple of things real fast, and then like Jesse and then uh, I'm sorry, Abraxas and uh, Cicadas are just hanging out in town for a while, not really seeming to do anything. And then I'll hit you with a couple of things again. Uh, I want to say when they first meet up in town, that's probably the best action scene. They're in like some sort of yeah. room or something. That's probably the best action scene. It's not good. Yeah. But it's probably the best action it's scene. It's not in like movie. that well choreographed no. of a fight, but it's the best one in the movie. No, for, for the low bar. And it's movie, the one that is. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually also the best one that's like the best lit because it takes uh -huh. place in the daytime. And, that and you, you see so much more of what's going on and that's what the first one was lacking yeah. and even the finale fight was like in a dark warehouse yeah, yeah that the only light was coming in from outside mm -hmm. yeah well, it's such a low bar we're setting at this point this is yeah in which it's in not which good that, action that, yeah <laughs> and that end fight like just kind of ended yeah that's right he like yeah, kind of they... fell down and then something fell on him and he was dead that's right. Well, they do he that. He had a touching moment with. Yeah, they had a little small touching moment with his son, and then he died. Well, they established that thing uh -huh. where uh, you can axe ax that uh, the 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 voice, whatever the box, uh, the answer box. Yeah, if this is the culminator, and it'll do like this weird zappy thing to the person. <laughs> yeah, and so he, of course, uh, Abraxas does that to uh, cicadas. And that's his final end, uh, jumping ahead of it. Yeah. But, you know, you're not. <laughs> nobody's gripped by this movie. <laughs> yeah, no. We were just laughing at how abysmal and <laughs> terrible it is. No, no. Like, like this was definitely wasn't the, one of the more entertaining uh, great trash, but it definitely was worth the watch. This was... Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of great. I'm trying to think. Was there any other big moments I really wanted to bring up? There probably was. Oh, God, we got to talk about that romance. Oh, yeah. That, that one. steamy, yeah, that, that steamy romance. romance. That was like, it seemed like Sean Connery forcing levels at, at moments. And oh. then, oh, this is okay. <laughs> no, it's uh, like uh, the, the, the culminator's mother and Jesse hanging out. Oh. And then... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It just kind of happens. Where like, like, yeah. She she kisses him on the cheek. And he's like, "That's nice." And then she kisses him on the lips. Like, oh yeah. The, this this Jesse is like oozing chemistry throughout this movie. So uh, it's it's, it's that it's man was oozing see. charisma. Yeah. <laughs> I I think in that scene he literally probably read him off cards. Yeah. No. It, it, he is so dead. It and, like, seemed like yeah. And I hate to say it, but compared to Cicadas, man, he's acting in circles around him. <laughs> yeah. Thorson is, is a great actor. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that... Oh, oh my so, God. Yeah, my final thoughts on this one, though. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, 91 was wild as hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the... The Terminator vibe right off the opening, I I really kind of dug that, and it kind of gave me the idea, gave me a good mindset of what we are in store for. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Jesse, Je the whole time though, like typically Jesse Ventura is known for having a mustache, like a very thick and predominant one, mm -hmm. and some kind of interesting hair. Uh, so him shaving shaving it off, making himself completely bald, as well as the mustache, was a little weird at first, but. What? Yeah, there were a lot of times he sounded like Kevin from The Office to me, and I, I just couldn't stop laughing. Wasn't there something about him being bald, like some sort of story element or something? I kind of sworn they mentioned something like that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't... Like, I, it was brought up in such a way I wasn't even sure if they meant he didn't have hair, or if it was just some sort of sci-fi term they're throwing out at me. <laughs> I think that's probably what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? It was something about yeah. being bald. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Abraxas, yeah. guardian of the universe. I I lean towards enjoying it. I definitely want to check out that Rift Tracks. This is oh yeah. This is a movie when it's when it's boring, it's boring. When it's when it's entertainingly bad, it is entertainingly br bad in all the right ways. <laughs> yeah. So please, if you want that hour and a half. Yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah. It's worth a watch. Yeah, it's it's an hour and a half 
feels more like an hour 45. Um, <laughs> yeah, it feels more like an hour 45, but it it's good. But yeah. And, you know, there's a Belushi in it. Yeah, a random Belushi. He'll pop up out of nowhere and you'll be like, oh. It's not John. Jim Belushi. Yeah, yeah if you're looking not... for the less funny Belushi, here you go. <laughs> the one like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that one. Uh, he's fine, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> all right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have James Bond movies to pitch. So, Bobby, what is your pitch for oh, James Bond 26? All right. Well, I'm going to call this one uh, Through the Ashes. Um, casting Richard Madden as the lead. Um, uh, the female interest will be plays by Rose Leslie and will be G Gary Oldman. Money Penny will be Natalie Emmanuel. Uh, Q will be John Boyega. Uh, the Prime Minister of Britain will be played by Simon Pegg. Um, yeah, Felix Leiter will be played by Mark Ruffalo. All right, the, since this one's going to use a lot of um, uh, bad guys attacking the U.S. Naval or the U.S. Navy and using and utilizing a Navy ship, um, there's going to be a couple of naval officers in here. The first U.S. Naval officer is a is a admiral who will be played named uh, Glenn Thomas. He will be played by Jeffrey Combs. The Secretary of Defense, a General William Hawkins, will be played by the chin bruce campbell uh it's also going to feature a u.s president howard richards played by brad dorf and in a surprise quick cameo role tiger from you only live twice he will be portrayed by ken watanabe as well as 008 peter barnes portrayed by tom hardy Now, the the two primary naval people are going to be uh, Naval Captain Frank Pine, played by Aaron Eckhart, and Naval Lieutenant, who will be played by Jack Quaid. Now, we're going to have... Now, let me just tell you about the baddies, and then we're going to get into it. Uh, for uh, High Commanding, uh, High Command Officer 1 will be played by Timothy Spall. High Command Officer 2 will be played by Gwendolyn Christie. Uh, there is a special agent. There is an agent Ava Davies, an agent Sean Davies, and an agent Lily Davies. Uh, all respectively, one will be played by Karen Knightley, two Martin Martin Freeman, three Freeman Adjman or Adjman. And uh, there is a voice from the past or a past character, Thorne Cronston. He will be played by Toby Jones. There's also some more pit faces from the past that are going to be in this movie. Starting with uh, Sarah Manga, played by Killian Murphy, Dr. No, John Chow, Red Grant, Till Schweiger, Rosa Klebb, Lena Headley, Emilio Largo, Hugo Weaving, and Ernest Elstavo Blofeld will be portrayed once again by Christoph Waltz. Now, <clears throat> this movie is going to start somewhere off the coast of Japan. Kind of where the end of uh, You Only Live Twice took place, that hollowed out volcano. We're going to see a drone flying around inside, kind of scanning the area, or clearly surveying it. A little bit behind them, we're going to see a team of three people, the babies. One will be controlling the drone via a laptop, and, or a tablet rather, and the other two will be inspecting the air, like taking guard with guns patrolling. Uh, this, it, by the look of it, this looks like the first time anyone has stepped foot inside the base since that last bottle. Now, they find a area where the drone stops and it kind of alerts them to a wall. They kind of start tapping on it, realize that it's a, fa a false wall. They move it back. They walk up to a little control thing. They all three put a key in it and turn in unison. The voice of Thorne, uh, of, yeah, of a uh, Tov Kronstein comes over comes over a PA. He says, greetings. If you are hearing this, either we have been compromised or Operation Phoenix has begun. In this first phase, we, we will need, loot, need uh, new leadership. In the cryo chamber, you will find blood, skin, hair, saliva, plasma, samples of our most prized assets and top operatives. Photos of Blofeld, Largo, Kleb, Dr. No, Red Grant, and Scaramanga appear on screen. With our incubation chambers, a full-grown adults will be ready in only in just four hours. One of the Spectre agents radios back, so says, Head Command. 
Uh, the match is struck. Brendan, Brendan, the landing party. We see a team of Hydra agents, or I'm sorry, not Hydra agents, Spectre agents, come in and set up shop inside of the base. We see a U later. We see a U.S. naval patrol ship in the Pacific Ocean, just doing their daily routine of sailing. See a young guy, Jack Quaid, on the radar, kind of a seeing some weird activity coming from the general area where the base is. Uh, he calls the CO over, his commanding officer, Aaron Eckhart. Take a look at the bridge. Uh, they start to. Before they even notice anything, this, the naval ship is under attack by a Spectre submarine. Some men are killed, but the remaining ones, including the captain and them, are all taken hostage. All right. We're going to go to MI6, and, th and then quickly we go to MI6, where we see somebody walking down the hallway, bringing in a box of, fold of files to an office where we see a man sitting in a chair. We hear a voice say, here they are, M." And, and thank him, saying it's money, it's money Penny. M tells Money Penny that she needs to find J that they need to get James Bond in here immediately. We could go to Boston, Massachusetts, where we see a guy trying to like thinking like scale in to break into a building, into a small warehouse. He gets in there. You see him. We follow him all the way to the office, ducking and dodging security guards as he goes. Once he finally gets to the main office, he's able to crack the safe. Gets, in, gets what he needs and escapes without any issue. As he's escaping, we see lights come on everywhere and like sirens go off. We hear, we hear James walk into scene, talking to him as he's standing there on a wall and he's asking, what did he do wrong? The guy responds, he doesn't know and he told him to look to his right and he sees that he is on camera. We, see, we then see James turn talking to a group of people about the proper ways of making sure to always cover your tracks, we see that James is actually teaching a private security class. Lon walked away from MI6. He just decided to leave and he didn't want any more, so now he's teaching this. In the background of the class, he sees Felix standing there smiling at him. He ends the class early and he goes and has decides to have plans to meet up with Felix and catch up. At dinner, you know, Bond arrives, he gets to what he thinks he's there early. But he doesn't think anything twice because he's going to meet an old friend. Uh, he finds out that Felix and the party are already here. He kind of just thinks that's odd. So he's shown to the table and he's, while well, he gets there, he's seated next. Uh, he is surprised to see that there is uh, the Secretary of Defense as well as uh, the, Navi <coughs> the Navy Admiral sitting next to Felix. And he says, James, there's something serious. We need your help. And before James can even do, a phone comes in to the room saying, Mr. Bond, there's a phone call for you. And it's MI6. <laughs> Washington, D.C. Uh, James Felix, a naval, naval admiral and the secretary of defense are all in the White House awaiting the president. And pre the president walks into the room and he enters with M. And the men all sit down and watch a video that was sent to the media just moments before this meeting where it is a head command of, of Spectre 1 telling that they have the naval ship in them and they will be in contact again to, with their demands. But in the background, they're doing panning shots of the video of all the naval officers. The president stands up and says, that's my son. And they all know, and the rest of the men look at each other and realize that they have a, this mission took a more serious turn. We go to Monterey, California, where M and 007 are entering a base or are boarding a ship where they meet up with Q. Q's gadgets are the Aston Martin with all the belt with all the BMW bells and whistles, cufflinks that launch micro drones, four on each arm, and uh, plastic explosives as well. Uh, he has that badass watch from Goldeneye, and uh, Little Nelly 2.0. It's pretty much the same thing as Little Nelly, but it just fits two people. And uh, so, as 007, the Naval Admiral Felix and a small naval crew board a, board a small ship towards Japan. They land in Japan, and they're using an old safe house of tigers. And they start to plan the rescue mission. While they're out on surveillance, drone, like Bond is surveying some uh, drone footage that was taken earlier by one of the naval men. Uh, he sees a figure standing in a shadow like a silhouette, and he kind of just thinks that. It's odd. It looks familiar, but I don't think. I don't think. 
And yes. Sorry, my mouse moved and I lost my place. Okay, there it is. Later that night, while on the island, while close to the island surveying it, they, uh, they're, and they hear a faint noise behind him. Bond, Bond is there alone. He turns around, and it's one of the Davies siblings. They punch him out, knock him out cold. By the time that James comes to, he's in a room tied to a chair, and just one light facing on him. The door opens, and Red, and, uh, Red Grant walks into him and punches him really hard, like talks to him a little bit. He's shaking his head, not sure like what he's seeing, like thinking he's seen a ghost. He punches him really hard and Bond is out cold again. He later wakes up in that same room with a very similar setup with a screen and a shadowy figurette there. But he knows the voice. It's the voice of Emilio Largo. And Bond says, it's like, you know, I think I know what you what you're about to say. And then the voice responds with, oh, my dear Bond, you haven't even started to know anything at all. Later, he later uh, later he's dragged out and thrown into a cell where he meets a, a woman by the name of Laura Tompkins. Uh, Tompkins is a reporter and a photo gener- journalist. Uh, she was detained for trespassing on the island and recording illegally, pretty much. They just detained her because she, they figured she was up to no good. They also destroyed all of the camera gear that she had, as well as killed the entire film crew she had with her. Uh, after about 14 hours, James hears a faint whisper coming from the vent. It's it's, double o, it's double o 008, Peter Barnes. He informs James to avoid the east wall in 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. As the wall, as a door-shaped hole breaks through the wall and creating an exit for them, they leave, and as the guards break into their cell to try and fire and stop it at them, the same door facing a battering blasts open a foam padding that captures, that imprisons the guards in a safe padding inside the old prison cell, making it so that they all can't escape. Uh... As they're trying to hide and get away from them, 008 is discovered by the guards and is captured. James and Laura escape on their boat and ride back. They have a conversation, and as they're over there, you know, James realizes that she's just no dainty girl. Now, this is uh, something where I'm just going to kind of break and talk for about. I wanted to try and do something different with the Bond girl this time. Now, they've tried a lot of different stuff in the in the past but i find whenever they try and build them as somebody who's really bad and tough you know like they always kind of at some point kind of become a little bit of a bumbling fool with a weapon in their hand and and it's something that kind of annoys me because if they're going to build a character like that up why even do that if they're not going to be able to fully execute now sometimes they have not done that like they uh did that with uh tomorrow never dies but i i just kind of want it to be like we're going to set the expectation for what you think this character will be and then completely blow, change your mind on it. So in this conversation, they find out that, yeah, she's been doing photography for years. You know, she uh, did a lot of photo war j- journalism, was in combat, taking photos in the midst of battle a lot of the time. Growing up, she was a competitive sharpshooter. <laughs> and Bond is like very shocked and taken back by this. He kind of first calls bluff. And, you know, they're at a, in a gallery eating on this small little naval ship. She takes a straw and a napkin. Bond sets a cup up on the other side. She closes her eyes, turns towards it, and shoots and takes the cup out. <laughs> so Bond is impressed. He's like, oh, okay. You're good. <laughs> All right. As they're uh, escaping, they find a small camp where they have double o- where two guards that capture double OA to have him. Uh, Bond and Laura both dispatch the guards with ease. Right at that moment, they see a small boat, a, a small kind of boat coming in, a small dinghy, sorry. And it's it's Felix and Tiger. They're here to get them out and get them back to Tiger's safe house. They do. They share some more stories and all kind of have a good laugh on the on the trip back. Back at Tiger's safe house, they're greeted by, by the Secretary of Defense with some real news. Inspector Hijack, 
hijacked a full worldwide broadcast demanding money and introducing the world to the new to the reincarnated Blofeld, Kleb, Dr. No, Grant, and Emilio Largo and Sarah Manga. And they inform the world of their sinister plan, saying they're going to hold every major city hostage, threaten of nuclear war, and just killing everybody. And they're also holding a and they're also holding a special ransom for the United States. This will all be changed if the United States pays. So it's the U, if the U.S. doesn't pay, the rest of the world will die. They have to pay for every head that is on that naval ship that they seized. Every every human being dead and alive. The higher the rank, the higher the price. Yeah. So after the after we see the broadcast go and the world react to it. Uh, before the broadcast ends, the Secretary of Defense gets a call. It's the president telling him to use every aspect of the military to make sure that we can get our men back alive. Uh, we go back to the volcano base. And we see Spectre having a meeting with Blofeld sitting at the head. He's congratulating everyone on a successful uh, Operation Phoenix. And at the end, they're all having a great joyous moment. We hear Blofeld sharply ask, Spectre had command one. How long were you going to keep the, the chemical compound a secret from the table and keep it in or keep it for yourself as a fail safe? Before he can respond, he is choked with piano wire by Red Grant. Uh, head command two is promoted to number one and advises her not to have the same carelessness as her predecessor. We then see the Davy siblings monitoring a control room. Well, the two of them monitoring a control room. While Lily Davies is torturing one of the crew members just for her own and, and her siblings' enjoyments. After this, we see a uh, break in. We see the rest of the team, our, our heroes, James Bond, the, the British Navy, Tiger's Army, as well as a shit ton of US troops all planning a big rescue mission and they pretty much just recreate the ending of uh, you only live twice only they completely destroy the completely destroy everything uh the final showdown after the uh, while this big battle is ensuing because they strike because our, our heroes strike immediately after that announcement don't even give them a chance to enact their plan during the final battle uh blofeld and kleb and grant are all making their escape while having the admiral and the lieutenant held captive. At some point, their Bond has them and he's telling them to let them go. Let them go. We see uh, we see the lieutenant push Kleb off a off a ledge, falling to her death. They all kind of stop and look at him, but we also see that the lieutenant has her pistol. He turns to the naval admiral and shoots him in the head. And then he points his gun at Bond, informing him that he helped them all. He found the old file, and he helped get all of this up. So it was the na the young, the president's son who helped all of this take place. So they have Bond throw his weapon down, leave him in an incomparable situation as they escape. Tiger and the rest save him, and Bond is able to thwart their plans and their escape, killing all of them in the end with an explosion. And that's the kind of the sh and that's the gist of it. All right, uh, I believe you had me sold with Bruce Campbell, so uh, I, I have to follow <laughs> that one up. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, I again, this is all like a lot of it. What I had, um, I'm going to defend some of my choices. I know some of them I just kind of filled in, and this isn't a fully completed idea. No, no, uh, I want. Yeah, yeah, it's a bitch. yeah, yeah. And admit. Uh, as we were both talking about, admittedly, we did not. I did not have the full time I wanted to write with this, but um, there was a lot of stuff I did, and I mean, I think John Boyega would have been great. And actually, with my original plans, I had stuff that was uh, like I made little notes next to the actors' names of ones who I who would have ended up living throughout the whole story and everything. Uh, I had uh, M dying. <laughs> 008 dying, Prime Minister dying, uh, the Naval Admiral dying, and oh yeah, Bruce Campbell got injured. So did Felix, so did Q and Money Penny, as well as Laura and James. But yeah, I did plan for the kid to, to be the traitor. Wow. I planned for that one. Yeah. I thought that was good. Blofeld got away. 
Largo died. Uh, Cleb, uh, I wanted her to get away in the end, and Grant to get away. Uh, Dr. No would die. Yeah, I didn't even do anything with Dr. No or Scaramanga. <laughs> well, uh, this seems like it's a soft reboot revival of the old series. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Kind of more going for, like, just the what I felt they should have done as the true rise of Spectre. And I tried to think of a way, like, okay, so if it, let's just say in-universe, if I'm going solely off of it's, it's the same agent throughout every James Bond movie, mm -hmm. they're all dead. What's the best way to bring them back? Because I'm, I'm presuming they all just didn't, like, they're still living Spectre agents. Yeah. They're not going to be like, oh, well, this is done. Yeah. It was fun, guys. See you at the salt mines. Yeah, no, it's kind of like the same philosophy with Inglorious Bastards, which is kind of where I it gave me the idea, sort of, mm -hmm. where Aldo would always ask, "Are you gonna put? Are you gonna leave that Nazi outfit off in the closet, or are you gonna put it on when you're living over there?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That made yeah. me think, like, you know, yeah, are they gonna do that? No, they're not. I, you know, they won't. Yeah. So that's where I went with it. <sighs> All right. Yeah. No, I, I, I am interested. Uh, I want uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, MGM, go ahead and give Bobby a couple million dollars, to make his movie. <laughs> Come on, like I, I'll I'll hire Nolan to write it. There you go. <laughs> Just tell him like, that's what I want. And, and on one condition, though, I would want one one solid condition, the same DP as uh oh god, I can't even think of it now. The same director of photography from Casino Royale. Ooh, Just yeah. let him, yeah yeah give me him. <laughs> All you right. Could, well, you could achieve what you want. <laughs> uh, I think it's my time for my pitch. Uh, mm -hmm. So I put together a pitch myself. Uh, I took a very different route. Um, well, not very different. It's we. I totally went down the uh, alternate path. There's really three paths you can take. You can do a revival, completely fresh reboot, or a sequel to No Time to Die. And for me, I thought the the one with the most potential was uh, a sequel, actually. Uh, James Bond is dead. What happens now? I think there's a lot uh, of potential with that idea. Uh, I don't have nearly as much written down as Bobby, uh, but I have like basic story ideas, and I have an opening. But I'm gonna I'm gonna start out with the basic story ideas. So Spectre is scattered. They're hurting after no time to die, but they weren't wiped out as previously thought. They're scattered because they have agents all over the place. And right now, they're looking for James Bond. They've heard that James Bond is dead, but they don't believe it. They, they think that's all bullcrap. Uh, so they're scattered all over, trying to find him out. Uh, and as far as MI6 can tell, uh, the head of Spectre is actually this rich billionaire who's actually working on this secret Mars base uh, he's launching uh, ships into space. I was going to set up so his ship looked a lot like a penis. But I was concerned that would be too uh, evil villainy. Too obviously a villain move. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to tone it down a bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But, yeah, they're theorizing that this guy's the head of Spectre. He has all this money. Uh... And uh, MI6, there's actually a specific person they're after who has a previous history of James Bond that uh, Spectre seems to be going after. And MI6 picks him up. This is a person that's not part of MI6. But uh, Spectre has a special interest in him. So they're going to train up this person. Uh, and eventually what uh, MI6 is going to learn is that the name James Bond carries weight with Spectre. They are after James Bond with a fiery passion. So why let him die? Let's have someone else carry on this name. And that brings us to the opening. How do we start this? So, this is going to be the most important part because you got to establish who this new character is. So we're going to start out with no gun barrel sequence. Movie just opens. Fade in. However you want to do it. Uh, we, we were, we're at the front of this fancy hotel, of course. Fancy hotel and casino. Naturally for James Bond. And Aston Martin DB5 pulls up. And out steps, we, we, we start at his feet. 
Out steps a well-dressed Henry Cavill. It pans up, we see him. He looks exactly like James Bond. And he goes inside the restaurant, walks up to the bar, pours our martini, shaken, not stirred. Then he turns out, and he looks at the crowd. Then, apparently to no one, he's, he just says out loud, you're not very good at this. Next to him, we see Paloma, uh, the CIA agent we saw at the begin, or not the beginning, but in the last movie, No Time to Die. She worked with uh, Felix, and she looks awkward and surprised. If you remember her character, uh, she's not great at undercover stuff, but when action happens, she is on point, and she knows, she knows, she, she's someone you want behind your back. But just like when it's undercover, she's not the best. <laughs> And she's kind of stumbling about, she, she drops something, she's like, what do you mean? And without looking at her, looking all suave, he's like, you're clearly over your head here. Who are you? And she, she introduced herself, she's, she's Jamie Paloma, CIA. And then he introduces himself. He's Connor Travers, MI5. How long have you been doing field work? Oh, on and off for about six months. On and off? Well, this is my second field mission. It shows. She looks him up and down. Are you willing to give me some pointers? And he, of course, raises his eyebrows. Do you have a room? Cut to the room, and they are all over each other. Uh, Paloma's back is against the wall. And Henry Cavill, whose name as my, or Connor, Connor tells her, well, you are not completely without your moves. I've been studying. So where is James Bond? Uh, James Bond is dead. They're still making out. We've heard that story before. Why all this talk of James Bond? Don't you want to be with me? My mission is to find Bond and bring him in. What makes you think I would know anything? He suddenly pulls away and grabs her by the throat, slamming the back of her head to a wall. Spectre is everywhere. James Bond must be brought in to secure his safety, and you were the one and you were one of the last people to see him. She's now struggling to get the words out. Spectre is dead. I saw them die. Spectre is a ghost. They have agents everywhere. You would soon you would sooner catch a unicorn than kill a little Spectre. Now tell me, what do you know? He loosens his grip on her, but still keeps her pinned to the, pinned to the wall. Oh, damn, I messed this up. Uh... All right. Connor Trevelyan, a 006. This is what she's telling him. Connor Trevelyan, a 006 in MI6. Oh, you see, I need to tweak this. I, had, I didn't finish tweaking this. Uh, Alec Trevelyan, part of MI5, son of Maria and Alec Trevelyan, grandson of Marcus Trevelyan. Marcus was a well-known Leon Cossack, known to have worked with the Nazis, but attempted to run to the UK only to be executed there. You joined, MI, you joined MI5 and attempted to undermine that organization that unjustly killed your grandfather. You are a prime, you are a prime candidate for Spectre. You seem to know a lot. You seem to know a lot for a clear newbie. Well, I still have a lot of learning to do. There are two things I'm skilled at. One of them is research. That research will get you killed. She chuckles. He strengthens his grip around her throat. And she simply says, You assume you have the upper hand. The confidence and menace in his face is suddenly drained. He looks down. Paloma has stabbed him in the stomach. He moves his hand to stop her, but is too late as she turns the knife. He screams in pain and removes his hand from her throat with and removes his hand from his throat going for the knife. He falls back a few steps and pulls the knife out. And she simply tells him, You know your weakness, Connor? A pretty face. Well sure, all men have that weakness. So do women for that matter. But your weakness is your emotion. 
Right now I can see the anger in your eyes. You are enraged at me letting You are enraged at me and letting your emotion overrule your judgment. You had me, but you let me go. And I because I stabbed you. With hatred in his eyes, Connor simply looks at her and says, I assure you, it is not a mistake I'll make again. Tell me, what else are you skilled at? He throws he pulls the knife from her he pulls the knife from his gut and throws it at her. She barely dodges it. And instantly, he has a gun on her. She kicks it out of his hand. He lunges towards her. She barely rolls out of the way. Right to where, he, right to where his gun landed. He picks up his backup piece and points it at her. Right as, she picks up the, right as she picks up the gun. And we get the gun barrel sequence with Ploma. And that's kind of my idea of how to introduce a new James Bond with a character we already have in canon. And kind of a little bait and switch at the beginning with Henry Cavill, obviously, yeah. filling in the role, but not actually. Uh, yeah. But the idea of kind of like the legend of James Bond still living on. Uh, I don't know. I just think uh, there's potential with the current universe we, that, that's already built up. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do a whole... Uh, a whole fresh reboot. Uh, so honestly, if I were doing a Bond movie, I'd want to do some sort of sequel where he's dead. Or maybe even Bobby's idea where it's a revival. Yeah, I mean, or even do a combination of the two. Yeah, where, yeah. Like, we take your Bond and just pit, replace it with mine. Hey, hey, potentially. I like <laughs> that. I really like that as an opening to it. <laughs> I mean, but I, I, I don't know. I felt really strong about that opening sequence I wrote. I thought that was just the most, like, I try to think of how a lot of those old Connery ones opened. Yeah. And how they had you see the element of danger right away. You, they, like, we see oh, the yeah, bad guys yeah. acting out their plan. And then we just do a clip, like, go to a shot of Bond or even the fake out one with uh, from Russia with Love. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, it varies. But I do, it varies with those I dangers. really, but I really do like that. I like that idea. That, that that bait and switch right at the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you got to introduce nice. with an obvious Bond stand-in, if nothing else. <laughs> so, uh, the one actor I picked for Red Grant, that was one that I kind of had a real tough time casting. Mm -hmm. At first, I picked Tom Hardy just out of the sake of it, and I was thinking, like, well, what if I want Tom Hardy to be a good guy, and I don't want him to be a bad guy? I, I, uh, and I know he could, he could play a bad guy very well. Like, I know that. But <clears throat> I just I just kept thinking more about it, and I picked Till Schweiger. Uh, he uh, was Hugo Sticklitz from uh, *Inglorious Bastards*. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But I knew him from a movie called *SLC Punk*, mm -hmm. where he played a guy named Mark. That's what I originally knew him from. But I, I did some research on just to see if he's you know has he done any more American films, or is that's pretty much the ones other than just bat background actor as like you know action movie i think he was in like a few bruckheimer ones i think he was in the rock as a background thug oh sure but him i just thought like yeah if there's going to be anyone that i wanted him to be a bit bigger build than my bond richard mcfadden oh, okay yeah yeah and yeah he was because red was a little bit bigger because uh, robert shaw was a bit stockier than uh, sean connery and robert shaw played him originally you know, I didn't even think about, uh, so I didn't even go over my cast. I might do that in the story. So, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. just real quick, I don't have that many roles really plot out. Um, I definitely am bringing back, uh, when Ben Wishka, no, there's no K in there, Wishaw, Ben Wishaw as Q, uh, he's going to be the agent, uh, of MI6 who kind of picks her up, not kind of early on, uh, not obviously not because of, he's a field agent, but because he's nearby. <laughs> Uh, and, of course, we're going to have a little adventure with them. Her primary partner from uh, MI6 will be uh, 004, as played by Idris Elba. And uh, the villain, uh, the rich guy with uh, the not-penis rockets, because that's too obviously villainy. It, I'm, <laughs> I'm envisioning Josh Brolin for that one. Uh, and, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with that. <laughs> I, I, I know that with mine, I did kind of accidentally go a little Game of Thrones heavy with the casting. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, there are, there are a fair amount. Well, what's this? There are, yes. Who else was there? 
Let's see. I could read them all to you. Uh, Richard Madden. Yeah. Uh, Rosie Leslie. Yeah, Rose Leslie. Uh, the Wildling. The You Know Nothing, Jon Snow. Uh, let's see here. Lena Headley. Oh, that's right. You did have her. You had a uh, lot of cast, though. Wind- mm. Gwendolyn Christie. Yeah. And Gwendolyn Christie. Mm. Timothy Spall was a choice that I was happy with. And uh, did I say Dr. No would be, D- would be John Chow? No, I don't recall. I don't recall Jeffrey Combs either, so. Yeah, Jeffrey Combs was the Navy Admiral. Okay. I thought well, that would be Well, more Jeffrey role. Combs is always better in my book, so. <laughs> well, yeah, him and Bruce. Yeah. Oh, and they would, and they, and they would, they would butt heads. Yeah. And it would <laughs> just be, like, comedic gold. Yes. <laughs> I would just tell, like, tell them both, like, guys, just, just, fr- fr- like, friendly ribbing, <laughs> but, like, Try to pull rank with each other, but yeah. you know, since you're both at different divisions, rank doesn't really matter. Nah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and Brad Dorif as the president, because oh. I, 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 that man kid is great. No. And a very, very underrated actor. Yeah, Brad Dorif can. I don't know if I want to say he could do anything, but he's never a bad addition to any movie. Period. <laughs> no, and and I've I've had this argument with uh, people and how they just don't think that. Because I say it, and usually they'll go, like, you mean the guy from Chucky, the guy who does his voice? Name something like Sear. Other than that, he's done. I just deadpan look at him. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Mm. Oh, he wasn't in that. He was Billy Bibbit. You want to tell me that guy doesn't have range? No, no. Uh, yeah. I don't know anybody <laughs> who'd ever criticize Brad Dorf in a movie. That uh, I would think you're yeah. insane. <laughs> Yeah. I, Simon Pegg, I feel that he would fit very well into that. And if I was going to try and kind of recreate that era of Bond, because those are the movies that I really just loved the best, um, mostly just aesthetically. I mean, you know, the misogyny shit I could deal without. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that, and that shit was not going to be in there. And I tried to make it at a point not to write that he, that he and Laura slept together at all. Well, and I kind of wanted to make him an equal, like her, his equal. Well, you even brought up the uh, how you, you end up with these La Bond girls, I swear to God. They seem like they're fairly competent, and then they just, they can't handle anything. I think, what's they like, Diamonds Are Forever was the one that, yes, I want to say that one bugs me. That, that actually, when I was writing about her, I was watching clips from various action sequences, mm-hmm. and it was that one scene where she just doesn't know how to hold a machine gun yeah. when she seemed perfectly capable, and the, yeah. I was just, what the... What? Yeah, it's like, okay. Why? I feel like they, they write so many of the female characters, like, okay, once James Bond shows up, you're useless. What? No. <laughs> like, his his magnetism causes it. I, like, what the hell is that? I mean, it's the same thing that uh, Men in Black 2. As soon as Tommy Lee Jones shows up, Will Smith is an idiot all of a sudden, when he was perfectly confident yeah. throughout the rest of the movie. <laughs> now... Truth be told, I had a harder time picking the villains than I did the good guys. <laughs> well, villains, uh, especially if you're trying to go outside James Bond, so many people have done that one. Like, I, I, like, I tried even, like, writing, I first wanted to put Lena Headley as a M. I thought she would get, but I kind of also, at the same time, was like, oh, would that be more or less like, you know, I'm giving like, and I and I was gonna hit you up. I was like, can I pick dead actors? Uh, you know, because <laughs> someone who's popped who popped up in my head, who I'd love to see be a Bond villain, who I unfortunately can't, would be a uh, Christopher Plummer. Yeah. yeah God. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. I mean, yeah. If I could, yeah, if I could have, he would have been he would have been Blofeld. That because that would that would be ooh. epic. Man. But for uh, Emilio Largo, I picked Hugo Weaving, and I thought that was. Sure, sure. Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, for the Spectre High Command, who ends up getting killed, Timothy Spall. Oh, well, yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, yeah. He's a great yeah, actor, he but... Bad, he, he, but he's in it for himself. Yeah. He may be bad for the cause, but yeah. he's in it for himself. And you never feel bad guy. to see him die. <laughs> I, I totally I'm sure Harry he's a great guy, him. but... <laughs> I, I totally Harry Pottered him, and I will admit that. Oh, yeah. I oh. totally did. I assume because I was even thinking about it. I was like, well, I want one of the high commands to trade to like betray Blofeld, mm-hmm. not necessarily give up to the allies, but do something not in the interest of Spectre, causing him to die. God, okay. <laughs> and, I was like, and, I, and I asked my wife, like, hey, who was the actor who played like, you know, Scabbers? That guy. Like, who was that? Speaking of deceased actors that shown up in Bond villains, Alan Rickman 
Oh my god. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, Lena Headley as Rosa Klebb. You guys are thinking, like, I just don't want to put Rose in that her in that type of role, you know? I think she's so much better than that. She could do more than that. Mm-hmm. And you know, the more I was thinking about it, I was like, yeah, but she really was such a bitch at Cersei. Yeah, she was. <laughs> she was such a nice cold bitch at Cersei, and I loved every second of it. Yeah. <laughs> She would be great as Cleb if she has that. And it was like a little bit more of her character in um, uh, Doom. In the, or not not Doom, but the remake of uh, Dread. Oh, sure. God. Mm. Yeah. If it was like that. But like she could be that like physical too with it. But with the manyness of, of Cersei Lannister. Mm. Uh, John Chow. I want to see him play a bad guy. I've seen him play a comedic bad guy. I want to see him play a ruthless bad guy. And comedic I think he could be guy. just. Where did he play bad guy at all? Uh, wasn't he the bad guy in like that? Um, I want to say he was in Scott Pilgrim and he played a bad one of the bad guys. No, I don't think so. It was some young teen thing where he was in it. I, I, might, I might be thinking of something else. I might be brain farting too. I I, I could I I know I am too, but I I'm I'm probably mistaking him for another actor, which is horrible of me. But mm. I still though I I I'd like to see him play a bad guy. I think he could do it. He yeah, no, I think he could do. Sulu, yeah. I mean, have you seen, um, uh, going off point here, but have you seen uh, the, the the production photos for Cowboy, Be- uh, Cowboy Bebop? Yes, yes, I have. I'm not going to lie. Those, that looks amazing. <laughs> Fucking awesome, yeah. Uh, for the uh, for the Davies, I made these, like, siblings, and I wrote, like, a little backstory for them. Um, they're all three from, like, a smaller, like, area in England that were uh, all orphans due to a previous bond fight that took place in England and some of the destruction caused leaving these three different kids from different families orphans all adopted by a family who were operatives of Spectra the Davies because uh, there's a Freema Ad- Adjaman uh, she was Martha on Doctor Who yeah yeah the, yeah and uh, Martin Freeman because again I want to see him play a bad guy he yeah. kind of did in at World End. He kind of was at at World's End. A he bit, yeah. It was technically uh, not, but like at the end, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, and Karen Knightley because I also think she could play a really good bad oh, bad yeah, person. Yeah. And you know, Killian Murphy, he's a good bad guy. He he's one of those guys who can pretty much do anything. He he's he's kind of entering that point where he's he's pretty good. He's pretty good anywhere. <laughs> and I thought. If there was any Bond role that I could recast him as, would be Scaramanga. Yeah. He he could do it. He could be that cold and calculating. I just think of uh, his performance in uh, Red Eye. I I have not seen Red Eye actually. So. Oh, that's a good that's a good suspense one. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for uh, Trav and Tov Kronstein, I kind of you know Hans him like for like uh, Winter Soldier, or not Winter Soldier, but yeah, Winter Soldier him. Like, you know, the consciousness in the computer. Oh, okay. Because uh, he's the voice of Tov. Yes, so, yeah, yes, I, I saw yeah, that, I, yeah. I, so, uh, I, I kind, yeah. I what was the name of this character? Uh, he was a doctor. Yeah. Hair doctor. Yes. Oh, what was the name of the character? I know the character. It's like, name. Famous Marvel character. Armin Zola. Armin Hanzola, yep. Mm-hmm. But yes, uh, yeah, so uh, we did a little something there for the, for the podcast. Let us know what you think. Let us know, like, if you could mix and match our pitches, what would you want? Um, uh, or you could tell us how badly we screwed it up. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we all know in the comments, uh, they will. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they don't hold I mean, but hey, negativity. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to try and make it more of a personal habit to engage more in them. I think that's, that's nice, oh, yeah. too. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, because I I appreciate all the comments and uh, and the times you guys watch the video that it it means hey someone likes what we're saying or yeah. at least they want to hear us yeah or they definitely. just want to build up enough fuel to <laughs> hey whether or not you hate watch or you just you you think we have yeah. a nice soothing voice I appreciate you watching or listening <laughs> yeah it works too. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, next week, what do we have next? We have Eternals next week. And I don't know anything else I have planned. 
I, I don't know. My Disney Plus subscription told me that they're going to be charging me ten dollars or more for a year. So I mean, uh, that makes me wonder. Uh, <laughs> So does that mean I get that stuff since I'm paying that seventy now? Oh, does that I assure that? you, no. The Mouse House just or do I have to money. still pay you another seventy dollars to watch it that like few times or twenty four hours? Some crap. Well, I do think Eternals. I think Eternals is supposed to follow the same path as uh, Shang Chi. Yeah, where it's like forty five days until it's even on there. Yeah, which is kind of annoying. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did that. Like, Black Widow just recently got put on there. That's right, yeah. Disney Plus is evil. Oof. That wasn't Ohio that they filmed in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't expecting it to be. <laughs> no. I was actually kind of I mean, shocked looking at in Ohio. It, yeah, and it said that, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, that looks like my backyard uh -huh. right there. <laughs> yeah, totally. That looks like my neighborhood street. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, was wondering what David it, Harper was doing running around yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, though, there are a lot of areas in the state where there aren't sidewalks. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Eternals next week. Uh, I guess we'll probably play around and see what ideas come up. Um, yeah, we, we had mentioned maybe talking a little oh, yeah. bit about the Scream. Scream, franchise. I forgot about Scream. So, uh, yeah, maybe rewatch the first one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we want to do a little, like, full conversation on... on I guess we three, could do, like, uh, kind of talk about Scream movies interspersed. Until yeah. Until we get to the new one. That could be fun. Like, every few weeks covering yeah, our Scream uh, movie. Yeah, because I'm not sure when the release date is for the fifth one, but I know that trailer dropped recently. Yes. Uh, and I, I mean, aside from talking about new alleged leaks and everything that we have that that are coming out, I know that there's some randomness coming on about. Well, at least there's one channel on YouTube that has been covering Marvel stuff, and they're f most of the time, like 45 percent of the time, on point with it and make some good calls. But like, I I think the past week and a half, I've maybe seen three uploads a day about the new Spider-Man movie. I don't really want to say any of them. Because, mm -hmm. again, I don't know if they're true or not, but, I mean, it, it it's looking to be, it'll be pretty cool. What? What channel but, I mean, is I this? I, uh, 3C films, okay. I think. I've not yeah. heard of them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. My favorite. Yeah, they're, they're good. My favorite, some good energy. My favorite will always be uh, the We Got This Covered article. Talking yeah. about uh, a little while ago, Tom Holland signed a nine movie deal for, for, for MCU, where the first three movies are going to be the high school years. Second three movies are going to be the collage years, and then the next three movies will be the adult years. And yeah, yeah, they said collage. And there, somebody was like, uh, did you mean college? And I just had to respond, no. This is when he's really into collage artwork. <laughs> he does it as well as being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yes, he has to balance being into collage artwork along with being a Spider-Man, okay? <laughs> Like, you know, some small businesses will give him, like, a ham or something. He'll give yeah. them a little Spider-Man collage doll. <laughs> Come Here on. You are. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most interesting aspect of Spider-Man that's never explored. I mean, yeah, that, 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 those are the Punisher ones. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. From the trailer alone, I'm still excited. Um, oh, yeah. Mm. I, I have a feeling, and there's... Well, the reason why I say I take everything with it as a grain of salt until I see the next trailer mm -hmm. or I know more about it from Marvel mm -hmm. or Sony. But, I mean, he's mostly talking about a new... I think Empire Magazine just did a story on it, and they released a lot of new photos and stuff. Like, we see new shots of the suits. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, but... One of the videos in particular, he's like, I don't think it's going to be all the Sinister Sticks. And he listed all the ones that he feels and predicts are going to be in there. And he didn't mention, make many mention of Scorpio. He's like, but for some reason, you know, they'll just start like having this small metal uh, mechanical Scorpion. I don't know. Maybe Lego thought it would fit to the movie. And I'm just thinking, you idiot. Mm. Scorpion. Mm. The, his, the villain. The guy who was introduced at the end credits scene. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't get cup. we don't know the suit yet, but yeah. Uh, well, we don't know the suit, but we know it's him because of the neck tattoo. I want to say and Matt the guy. Gargan. Is it yeah, Matt? and also well. yeah, and, and and I think a uh, uh, Costner. Uh, God, God. Yes, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Costner. <Yeah. laughs> 
No, the much better just, actor. I mean, I mean, actually, actually, Costner now. Yeah, I, I, I'd be okay with seeing him as a bad guy. Yeah, May, like he, he, uh, he could have the right, he could have the right campiness to be a Marvel bad guy, given the right uh, I don't know about structure. That. Like he's Guardians, this, man. I mean, he's. I think he's. Well, well. I mean, he's too. Oh, he's probably serious enough for a cat movie then, because those are kind of like Clancy novels. Yeah, my my fear of Costner is always that he just goes too dry. Yeah. Who, Costner? Yeah. I mean, I don't think he's gonna go like you know, um, uh, uh, Road to Perdition dry. Where was he on Road to Perdition? Was he, or am I thinking of uh, Hanks? Yeah, it's the Hanks there. Okay. Mm. What's the well, what's the what's the one that was uh, Costner, where it was pretty much the same one? And, like Hanks came out with that one, and he came up with a similar one. Oh well, there was a. I don't know if he did something like that, but he definitely did his own White Earp thing. Like not long after yeah. Tombstone, he did uh, White Earp. It's he like, did. yeah, you're not Kurt Russell, man. You're not Kurt. You're not, man. <laughs> Like you're great. Yeah, and you, you, you have your movies. Like one of, <laughs> yeah, you have your movies that are great, man. Like nothing will touch mm-hmm. <laughs> Field of Dreams. I will give yeah. you that. But, yeah, and Kurt. But you know, Kurt Russell's kind of at that point where I'm cool seeing him and everything. You're still yeah. out there. You're still <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe in the right role, but yeah. <laughs> but yes, uh, Eternals. Oh yeah, the other one I was thinking. It's tough to judge because I don't know anything about Eternals. I'm leaning towards maybe doing Eternals I... and Infinity War. Because they talk about Thanos so much in that trailer. But I don't know if that links they to do. it. Well, I mean, I, I I don't know much about them either. I'm probably going to yeah. go to Comics Explained once we get off here and do some quick homework. Yeah. Because uh, that channel's great. Yeah, yeah. It's Got... educational, especially when you're in a rut. Yeah. So... I, I, I'll plug that channel as much as I want because it's an entertaining one. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I'm super jealous of his voice. It is just such yeah, I a am too. fucking it soothing is voice. Butter. <laughs> it is butter. It's like, dude, how dare you get born with such a nice voice? No wonder you, you get like a shit ton of subscribers. I wish. <laughs> yeah, no wonder. Dude. Yeah, no wonder, man. I You could read stereo instructions. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, that's soothing. <laughs> I mean, you, we should petition that guy start a start a cameo, or where you just will like read random yeah. things, like you'll read cooking ingredients. Yeah, it's it's like uh, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken will do it entertaining. He'll do it so it's soothing. <laughs> soothing. Aaron Aronson. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, so probably Infinity War, definitely Eternals, Scream, and anything else that comes to mind between now and then for next week. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, everybody have a good one. I want to go ahead and add some audio credits at the end here. Uh, The theme music you're hearing at the beginning and end of this podcast was uh, written and performed by George Johnson, a very good friend of mine. And my current Patreons are uh, Fel Martins, David Lara, and Lindsay Painkhurst. If you'd like to become a patron, go ahead and follow the link down below. Anything you can provide would be incredibly helpful to this channel. We're barely limping by right now. Uh, I'd love to make this my full-time job, but I'm miles away from that right now. So any help you could provide, just a dollar a month would be amazing. You know you want to. All your friends are doing it.